You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. This is the story, right, of Samson written by your God. This is an incredible story for young people. Never forget the lengths that God will go to for you in your life. And just like every person here, you know why it's so important? It's because we are all called not according to our purpose, we're told. Are we brothers and sisters? In, in Paul's letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9, he says, we are called not according to our purpose, but according to his purpose that he will work out in our lives in Jesus Christ. And it goes for every single one of us. And you know, smack bang in the middle of this story, it says that God sought occasion or a purpose with the Philistines in the life of Samson. It was in that man's calling right from birth that God had a purpose. And how easy is it for all of us, even as adults, that we forget that we are not here by chance, are we? Not even close are we here. We didn't just stumble into this camp, stumble into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said that no man will come to my feet except the Father draw him here. God has worked in each and every one of our lives, to bring us to a knowledge and understanding of this book, which means we have a purpose. And we know what that purpose is, don't we? We quote it often. We learn it in Sunday school. We say, well, it's to fill the whole world with his glory. Absolutely. We have to believe that that's the case. The only way we're going to do that is if we are in that kingdom. Perhaps he sees that. Perhaps he sees that his purpose with us is to have us in that kingdom. And he's sitting back and watching what we're going to do with the opportunity that we have, just like the opportunity we have to sit and learn all about these people's lives. We have a great purpose that we are called to. And look inside this story. This man leads an incredible life, doesn't he? And, and yes, we, we, we sit back and we look at the story and we see how, just how hard we can be on the man. Just in our, in, in our own view at times, just how many times he may have failed in what he did. But this is also a great story of God's mercy, his enduring mercy and grace, that he would continually go back and work with this man, called to be separate to him from birth. And even though he failed from time to time, and it seems like his, his life's a roller coaster, brothers and sisters, God's always there, isn't he? All the way through. And what a wonderful type we will see contained in this man as well this weekend. Young people, you might think, well, the last person that would be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ is Samson. But it's not true. There's many types contained in this story. An angel foretold his birth. He was born and an angel would stand there and say, this is what's going to happen to a barren woman. And years later, before the Virgin Mary, an angel would stand and do the same thing. He would give his life for others in the end, would he not, not, brothers and sisters? This man lived a lonely life, as we'll see. Often he was by himself, just like the Lord. This man was betrayed at the hands of his own brethren, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. He was moved at times with the Spirit. There's not too many other people in, in Scripture that can say that. He was moved at times, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God working and directing in his life. And he possessed, even for a small period of time, Samson possessed the gates of his enemies, didn't he? Just as the Lord Jesus Christ will come and have that ultimate victory and will possess the gate of his enemies, Isaiah says. There are many... Uh, uh, types of the Lord Jesus Christ we can, we can see and we'll focus more on those, God willing, tomorrow morning in our exhortation. So our intention really is to move through the chapters over the next um, four sessions together and really, as I've alluded to, just tell the story, to be able to 
put our minds and our imaginations into what exactly took place and maybe grab a few, a few things along the way. Ultimately, the objective of our sessions together is to create conversation for us to sit and chat uh, about these things after. There's much to talk about, isn't there? So in chapter 13, we are introduced to, I believe, the start of the story. And not just being Samson, of course, given that he's the, he's the main subject of this period of Judges, the most written about him out of any of the Judges, but really the start of the story, I think, is his mother. She is an outstanding individual. And hopefully over the next half an hour or so, we will be able to actually build that picture for you in your mind that she is truly unbelievable. And, and in verse 1 it says, The children of Israel, that familiar expression in Judges, did again, did evil in the sight uh, of God, and God delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. And the scene is set, and we're introduced in verse 2, this 40-year period of judgment, that there's a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. Manoah there means rest, <clears throat> very similar to Noah's name. In Genesis, Manoah means rest, and we're introduced to that family circumstance. They cannot have children, and his wife was barren and bare not. <clears throat> barren, the word means sterile, and it's a harsher circumstance to live in as that word gives off. It's a very difficult uh, thing, particularly in this age, to not be able to have children. The 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 pride and the, the furtherance of the family name was carried in the ability to have children, to carry on that seed. And we're introduced to a husband and wife who, as you're probably well aware, also have great company throughout the Old Testament, don't they, where they cannot have children. Think of Sarah. We know the story with Abraham and Sarah. I've promised to be the father of many nations and he, he didn't even have children yet in the hands of the Philistines. Now you imagine being Manoah's wife sitting there hearing that. Angel doesn't even appear to take a breath. He gets, she gets the whole lot in one hit. She knows full well she can't have children. We don't know of her age. But he has to tell her twice that she will conceive. You see that? Once in verse 3, at the end of the verse 3, and then at the start of verse 5. You will conceive. You will conceive. He drives and emphasizes that point home. Young people, if you wanted to get a highlighter or a pencil or any sort of writing implement, do whatever you've got to do to get this in your margin or your notepad or, or your device. You have a look in verse 3, it says, the woman. You go through and highlight that expression in chapter 13. The woman in verse 3, the woman in verse 6, again in verse 9, verse 10, verse 11. Verse 13, and then over in verse 24. That expression appears seven times in this Judges chapter 13. The covenant number, isn't it? This chapter is all about promises. And there she is, the seed of the woman. This is how God is going to seek his purpose that he has with the Philistine. Those people that represented very f uh, sin and flesh itself, didn't they? And he's going to seek this occasion through the seed of this woman. And right now, it's a physical impossibility for her until this angel turns up. He says, you are barren, you will conceive and bear a son. Now we know in verse 4 and 5, this is uh, a reference to the Nazarite vow, isn't it? There, uh, in verse 4, drink not wine nor strong drink. Uh, and no razor will come on his head, for uh, the child shall be a Nazarite unto God, and he shall begin to deliver Israel. Now, he, the angel goes further later on in the conversation and actually goes back and reiterates these words in verse 14. Thou shalt not eat of anything uh, that comes of the vine, nor wine, nor strong drink, nor any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. The interesting thing about this is that this appears to be a split vow or a shared vow, like a co-Nazarite vow in some ways, doesn't it? 
So we know from the Nazarite vow, if you turn over to Numbers chapter 6, Numbers chapter 6 gives great reference in detail to that Nazarite vow. We won't spend long here other than to say this. If you go through and highlight the word separation in Numbers chapter 6, it appears more than 15 times. So the message is very clear about what is happening for this boy. He is going to be separated, consecrated to God. That's the message for the woman, for, the, uh, for Manoah's wife, separation. And there's certain rules that would go with this. And in Numbers chapter 6, the idea for Israel, for for this Nazarite vow was that at any time a man or a woman, which is in, it must be made note of, verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 2, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to God. They could do, uh, to do this, they would do certain things, a man or a woman. And what they would do is they would do this in order to imitate the work of the priest. So for a set period of time, they would separate themselves. And the way that they would do this, the, the indicators that someone was in a vow of separation to God is in verse 4, 5 and 6. All the days of their separation, they were to uh, eat nothing that is made of the vine tree and the kernels even to the husk. So anything that grew on the vine and any products that came by way of grapes, they were not to eat. The second thing, and the one we know most about is that they were not to cut their hair. The vow of separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled. So the other way you could look and see an indication that someone was in a vow of separation or had taken the Nazarite vow for a period of time that they would set would be that their hair would be growing long. They would not cut their hair. And finally, in verse 6, of number six, all the days that he separates himself unto the Lord, he shall not come at a dead body. In other words, he would not go near or touch anything that was dead. So it was very clear in Numbers chapter six. But when we come here to, to Samson's case in Judges 13, isn't it interesting? And we, of course, we, can, we draw some assumptions that he was to uphold that whole Nazarite vow. But written here, is that the hair on his head would not be cut. That was the directive to Samson. But to his mother, she was not to drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat anything unclean. And we often say that Samson, well, he broke his vow. Constantly he broke his vow. And, and if according to number six, which is what we believe, absolutely. But isn't it challenging for us to think that Samson wasn't told directly not to go anything, touch anything dead? Nor was he told directly not to drink wine, but he was told not to, to, to cut off his hair. That was the instruction. Either way, Samson gets to a point where he does that, doesn't he? He does end his vow to his God in the most spectacular fashion that we're going to see uh, God willing on Monday morning. Now, the whole hair thing, which is obviously synonymous with Samson, and of course is with direct relation to this vow, is very interesting as well. Because in Leviticus chapter 25, there's a tie here between a, a, a period of rest and his hair. In Leviticus 25, we won't spend a great deal of time here, but in talking of the year of Jubilee, what would happen is for six years you would work your land, you would come into the land, you would be given a, a, a portion of that land and you would work it and grow your fruit for six years in, uh, in that place. For six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years shalt thou prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. You're allowed to prune it. You're allowed to cut it. But in the seventh year, there's that seven again, the covenant number, shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for God. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. On the seventh year you weren't to cut it. So there's his mother being made a, a, a promise here that she will conceive and bear a son and he will be separated to God and by way of that separation he will be a Nazarite and you weren't to cut his hair. 
And his hair would represent that period of rest. When whatever grew on the vine in that seventh year went to God. It went back into the ground. Right? And here is Samson, the boy, and his hair would grow and that hair would represent the untrimmed vine, wouldn't it? He was separated to God. And in verse, uh, sorry, at the end of verse 5, it says, The child will be separated to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the land of the Philistines from the womb, and Nazarite from the womb. Isn't that interesting? You know, when we hold Samson's, the, the way he comes into the world, with the, with the angel appearing uh, to his mother, and then the instructions, the specific instructions that are placed around his life. Do you know there's a little bit of a, a pattern and a theme here that grows through Scripture? Because Samson's called from the womb and the purpose that God has with him is that he will begin to deliver Israel. Who from? The Philistines. He would start that work, wouldn't he? It's written right there. He will begin in verse 5 to deliver Israel. That was what he was going to do. Now, did he succeed? No, he didn't. He never just victoriously took Israel and, and overthrew the Philistines and brought them all together. He didn't do that. He began the work, didn't he? Separated to God. Who finished the work? Who finished the work? But it was Samuel. Samuel, brothers and sisters, also separated to his God. By Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and verse 11, she says and promises God that I will give him back to you and no razor will come on his head. And what does it say? Your margin gives a reference in 1 Samuel 7, verse 13, that the Philistines came no more into Israel under Samuel. Samuel had the victory. So Samson, separated to his God, would begin the work, and Samuel would come along and finish the work for that period of time. He would overthrow the Philistines. And who does that remind you of? Wasn't John the Baptist? separated to his God? He was. In Luke chapter 1, he was separated to his God. And what does it say? He would go and prepare the way, just like Samson would begin to deliver Israel. John the Baptist comes and prepares the way. Who's he preparing the way for? But the Lord Jesus Christ from Nazareth, the man that wouldn't just separate himself for a period of time. He separated his whole life, didn't he? And what does Hebrews chapter 10, verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 say about um, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's absolutely worth reading. You don't need to turn it up. You listen to this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily ministering and often uh, offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's what the priest did day in and day out. Paul calls them a shadow of things to come. And what were you doing with the Nazarite vow? But imitating the priest, that's what you were doing. But it had a start and an end. You couldn't do it for your whole life perfectly, could you? It had a start and an end, just like Samson's life. His time of separation had a start from the womb and he would separate it into the lap of Delilah. He would cut off that symbol. It had a start and end, but not this man. Paul says that priests did the same thing year in, year out in chapter 9. He said, but this man, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, there's the victory. John the Baptist prepared the way and the Lord Jesus Christ came, separated his life unto his God and lived a perfect life, did he not? And he separated himself and overthrew sin in that one moment. He had the victory. And what did he do? It says he sat down on the right hand of God. Interestingly enough, the priests are always referred to as standing. Why? Because their work kept going and going and going. From generation to generation, all the way through the Old Testament into the New Everyone's standing because they're, they're doing the work and they're passing it on. And then it gets to this man and he sits down because it's finished. He sits down at the right hand of his father. There's a great continuation of these larger themes all the way through the scripture, isn't it? And it's even found here in the little story of 
uh, Samson, brothers and sisters. So he would begin to do this work. And so what happens? The woman comes and tells her husband in verse 6, look at this, a man of God come unto me and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not where he was, neither told me his name. But he said to me, behold, you will conceive and bear a son. Here it is, drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat anything unclean for the child will be a Nazarite. From the womb to the day of his death. Now you imagine being Manoah and hearing this. You talk about being kept out of the loop, so to speak. God's focus is on the seed of the woman. He, he comes to the woman. This is what it's all about. And, and the, the character differences highlighted in this chapter and, and a little bit into the next are quite amazing between Manoah and his wife. Clearly, she is an incredible woman of faith. You look in verse 6. At the end of verse 6, after she says that that this man of God come to me, she says, I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Do you know what? In verse 17, Manoah turns around and asks him, what's your name? And in verse 11, he says, are you the man? Not an angel of God. Are you the man that spoke to my wife? What's your name? Tell us, what are we meant to do with this boy? Manoah's wife accepts everything that she's told in faith. She doesn't ask these basic questions like Manoah. There's a very big difference between the two. And it's highlighted as we move through chapter 13. You'll see. You see at the end of verse 7, For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So what's very interesting about this, and we stop and think about it, what choice did Samson have? Did Samson choose to dedicate his life to God? Or was it given to him? The reason we ask such a question, and maybe let our minds think about that, is that almost all of us, I would suggest, in this hall, came into an understanding of the gospel the same way, from the word. And almost all of us, and particularly young people, pay attention to this because in the end, you have to choose. And if you wanted to sum this story up, it's about being called to an understanding of what God wants from you and going through your life, attempting to do everything that you wanted to do. And in the end, at the end of Judges chapter 16, getting to a point where you choose yourself. And that's what he did. And that is what these chapters are about choice he might have been separated from the womb and he sat down and you know what his mum and dad taught him the truth and his mum and dad sent him to Santa store and his mum and dad made him go to youth group and all the while he's got his head out the back of the tent looking what everyone else is doing hey concentrate this is what we've got to do why because that mum had been given a very special task you know what the word was in verse 4 now therefore beware You know what it means? It means to hedge about. Thorns, the word references. And in order to protect the plot of land that would would grow what, what was necessary to feed your family, you would hedge your plot of land around about. And whether it would be growing these thorny bushes or getting getting the bushes and heaping them up all the way around, you must protect it. And that was what she was told. You protect the boy. Look over in verse 13. Of all that I have said unto the woman, the angel said, let her beware. There was a strong message there. And that's what our parents try and do. They try and protect us and put these things around us and teach us all of these things. But in the end, you have to choose. You know, God willing, later on today, we see that our next chapter, that a lion only gets into the vineyard when it's not hedged round about, when all the hedging, When everyone's taking their eyes off the ball, those lions get in and wander around. God's inheritance is what the vineyard was. We have to choose. And what we do know, brothers and sisters, and we need to share with our young people, is we all know full well that the choice comes in all different stages of life, doesn't it? It really does. That we can can be a part of our ecclesias. We can even get baptized and and dedicate and separate ourselves to God. But ultimately, this choice up here, the moment that it clicks, 
The moment that it all makes sense and we, we hand our lives off to God comes at all different stages. Look at what it took for him to do it. It took his eyes to be gouged out of his head for him to get to that point. Feeding his own enemies in darkness before he came to a point that he would make that willing choice to fulfill on that which was he was called from the womb to do. So in verse 8, the Manoah says, entreats, God and says, God, let the man of God, which thou descend again uh, unto us and teach us what we shall do with the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came out, uh, again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Noah, Manoah was not with her. So she visits, this angel comes and visits uh, Manoah's wife again. So now he needs evidence. He needs proof. You see this, the, the difference in the two people. He needs more evidence and more understanding. He, perhaps he feels he's been, been cut out of this a little bit. And let's be honest, this is uh, bordering. It, it is a miracle, isn't it? It is a physical impossibility, what is about to take place. And he wants to understand more. So he says to God, send that angel again that, that we might learn about what we're meant to do with this child. And that the angel comes to the woman. And the woman, in verse 10, makes haste and runs and shows her husband and says unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that comes unto me the other day. And so Manoah arose, it says, and went after his wife and came to the man. So she's out in the middle of the field on her own and suddenly the angel comes again and visits and talks of, of the great promise that she'd been made and the great work that she's got to do. So she, knowing her husband needs this evidence, needs this confirmation, comes and gets him and says, you come and meet him. And Manoah comes. And the first says, thing he says, are you the man that speaks unto the woman? And the angel stands there in front of him and says, yes, that's me. Verse 12. Manoah says, now let the words come to pass. How shall we order the child and what shall we do unto him? Give us the particulars. What do we do with what's about to happen? And what's his response? He says, everything I've told the woman, you beware. Everything I've told her, listen. Of all that I have said unto her, hedge about the boy. You watch him. Why? Because it's about separation. That whole a concept of being separate was enough for them to understand what they had to do with the boy. She may not eat of the, uh, the, anything of the vine, in verse 14, neither the strong drink or anything unclean. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we have made a kid for thee. He wants to get a sacrifice ready to sit down and have fellowship with the angel. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Though thou detain me, I will not eat your bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, you must give it to God. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Isn't that a stark contrast to Manoah's wife? She has grabbed him, walked him in front of the angel, and he turns around and instead of saying, you're an angel, or are you an angel? He says, are you the man <clears throat> that spoke to my wife? What was Manoah's wife's uh, first comment? Right back here. A man of God came unto me, who had the countenance like an angel. That was where her mind was. The man is standing in front of Manoah, and he still doesn't realize it's an angel. Do you know why? He's missing the point. The angel comes with a message for him and his wife of separation. He wants to sit down and have fellowship. The two opposite ends. He wants fellowship with this man and the angel is coming to say, you must separate yourself. He missed it entirely. And Manoah says to the angel of God, what is your name? that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. He's still missing it, isn't he? He wants to give all glory to the man standing in front of him. And the angel says, why do you need to know my name? It is a secret, you see. It's wonderful, the margin says. 
So in verse 19, Noah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon the rock unto God, just like the angel said he had to do. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. You imagine what this is like. As he went and, and, and pulled together some stones and made, made this little altar, and on it they offer this kid of the goats. And the angel would take it and he would do amazing things with it. And Manoah and his wife would stand back after receiving this promise. And you can imagine how Manoah's wife feels. She, she, one hand perhaps on her belly, the very thing that she would have longed for her whole life, the thing that had caused her so much pain. And there's a man standing there that has promised that great things were going to come by way of her womb. Great things were going to happen for Israel. A great responsibility. And she's standing next to a man, her husband, still confused perhaps about what is going on. And they look on, it says, for where it came to pass in verse 20, when the flame went up toward heaven off from off the altar that the angel of God ascended into the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and they fell on their faces. Can you imagine what that looked like? As the flames got higher and higher and the man, as Manoah had called him, would suddenly just disappear into those flames and he would be gone from sight. The most amazing thing they would have ever seen. They fall straight in their faces on the ground. And the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of God. It took the angel to disappear in front of his eyes. And then he knew it. Stark contrast to his wife, the seed of the woman. Amazing faith, who sat there and got a message from an angel and went and said to her husband, an angel appeared to me. And you know, throughout this story, God only ever talks to his mother. It's recorded, not to Sam Smith. Then the angel would no more appear to Manoah and to his wife, silent. And look, Manoah, he says unto his wife, we're going to die now. Surely we will die because we have seen God. A big difference to when Jacob wrestled the angel. Remember in, in Genesis chapter 32, he says, I have seen these things and now I'm preserved. That's what he called the place. Whereas Manoah, he says, we've seen these things. We're going to die now. But his wife with that continuing faith, he says unto him, if God were pleased to kill us, he would have not received the burnt offering and the meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would at, this, um, would at this time have told us such things as these. And there they are in the field in front of that smoldering sacrifice that's there, that offering that's gone up. The angel is gone and they're there and he's saying, we're going to die now. We can't have beheld all these things and, and anything good come of this. And she's there holding on like this saying, this is what's amazing. He wouldn't have accepted our sacrifices. She puts up a fight. She explains to her husband, he wouldn't have accepted the sacrifices. We wouldn't have been promised such things. I wouldn't be standing here and being told that we're going to have a child. How long have we tried for a child? And yet God, this man of God has promised us these things. And the evidence would come, wouldn't it? In verse 24, months later, perhaps in the, in the dead of night, out in that lonely place, up there in Zora, those two faithful people, in, a, in and amongst the whole nation that had turned their hearts away from God, in the middle of a period of trial of judgment for 40 years, and in the dead of night, Manoah's wife, those, those pain bursts would ring out right across the valley, and out would come this boy. and She would bear a son and called his name Samson. Brilliant sunlight, as it means. Born at the darkest time of Israel's existence, with the Philistines having domination over them, it says. And there he is. And there, that night, would be presented up to Manoah, the evidence of her faith. And so she would begin to guard and to hedge about that boy. You imagine raising him. Her work there begins. And she, every single day, 
would read to him and talk with him and teach him. And he would grow up in, the, in, the, in, a, in a very difficult period of time for Israel. And he would see the behavior of the Philistines. He would see the behavior of the Israelites. He would see apathy from his own people as he got older and older, that they would accept it. Later on, the men of Judah come and say, don't you know that they're our bosses? You're giving us a hard time here. Why don't you just pipe down and close your mouth? Let us live in, in, in unison with these people. They are our masters. That was the sort of place that he grew up in. And his mum would sit in that tent and teach him. Say, one day you're going to do amazing things. One day. And he would be different to all the other boys. Because he'd have his long hair like this. And she'd sit when he was young and 13, 14, 15, brushing his hair, getting him ready. There it was, these great locks, symbol of, of being separated to God. And he'd want to talk about it. And other kids would want to talk to him about it. He knew he was special from the womb. His mother would guard him about. She's an amazing person. In fact, so much so, brothers and sisters, that as he goes down to marry into Timnath, you know, a little, a little thing about his mum. It's when he sees this woman, he comes and he talks to his mum and his dad about what he wants to do. And his mum and his dad go down to see this woman. But when it come time for him to get married, his dad went. Mum stays home, it says. Verse 10 of chapter 14. So his father went down. And mum, who said, I will separate myself because that's what I've been asked and I will hedge about this boy. I can't do that. This is my vow. As, as the seed of the woman. She's an amazing, amazing person, brothers and sisters. And she would raise that boy to verse 25. It says, And the Spirit of God began to move at times in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtahol. Dan, the tribe that Samson's from, the only one that didn't have their, their, uh, their inheritance. And as he grows and, and his understanding of what God has cut him out to do grows, Suddenly in verse, uh, chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, Samson goes down to Timnath. The place means an assigned portion. It should have been theirs by rights anyway. And it's almost like as he grows and the Spirit of God begins to work in his life, that he begins to get, get all frustrated and he's ready to go on his mission. And he moves between Zorah and Eshtahol. And, he's, and, he, and, and it's almost like he says, right, right now I'm going to start. I'm going to get into this. And the first place he's going to pick is to go down to Timnath, the assigned portion, almost like he's going to go down and he's going to take it back. And he goes, Samson, it says, went down to Timnath. And he sees a woman of the daughters of the Philistines on his way to begin that mission, that calling, that purpose that God has, that occasion with the Philistines. He begins... And now he's distracted, isn't he? In the place, that assigned portion that he was called to return back to God. and takeaways from our first session together is has to be choice doesn't it there's a big one in there about us making a conscious decision with the calling that we've been called to to actually accept it and do something with it and that was going to be always a great challenge for Samson he was always going to be challenged by uh, in the end turning into a, a genuine or authentic commitment to his God, that which was, he was called to from the womb. But he did it. That was the point. And so I guess this is, a, a, there is windows into his life that sort of chronicle that journey to 
uh, that choice, the choice that he would ultimately make to lay down his life for others. And it was a big, uh, big journey, wasn't it? It was a big choice. And it's important for us to remember that we have in this story windows of time into his life. The many things recorded that Samson does that we don't know about. See, it, also interesting, the way the story is written for us, it's quite, it's quite slow in the beginning. There's a lot of detail in chapter 13. And then it sort of speeds up and, and jumps through pockets of time in his life. You've got seasonal references there, which take a bit longer than others. And then at the end, it almost slows down to a day-by-day day account of his love story with Delilah. So, so God seems to speed up and slow down this story with, with, with divine expertise to focus on the things that he wants us to know and to understand. And so in chapter 14, we have um, some moments in his life that have been captured for us to, to stop and consider. The first, obviously, is his uh, relationship and, and marriage with the woman at Timnath. Then, of course, is the sign of this lion. And so as we've done with chapter 13, we'll move through chapter 14 and just grab a couple of points um, for us to consider and, and talk about afterwards. So we left Samson when he went down to Timnath and he sees a woman. He sees a woman in the place, uh, uh, Timnath, which means assigned portion. So he's down there on the work of, of God, calling, being called to that purpose, and he sees a woman down there. And it says, and he comes back to his parents and he tells his father and his mother, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. And the instant reaction of his mum and dad is to sit down and explain the contrary. That's what they do. Now, why is that? Why, why do they sit there and explain that? Well, they explain that because that was what was explained to the mother so many years before. We don't know how old Samson here is, is here now. But it could be 20 or 30 years before that that angel would explain to Samson's mother, hedge him round about. Remember, his entire life is about separation. And now he says, she pleases me well. And their first response is, hang on a sec. Have you looked locally, effectively? Is there not, it says, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among them, uh, all my people that thou goest to take a wife for the uncircumcised Philistines. Interesting the word never there. Perhaps this has happened before. It almost implies to say, well, this has happened before. This always happens. Is there not someone locally? And Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. You notice who he speaks to. His father and mother come and talk to him about his decision. But he responds to his father, not to the, the one that, was, was, that dedicated her life to be separate. He goes by way of dad. And in the end, as we highlighted in our last study, it's dad that goes with him to get married and mum stays home. He directs that conversation. He says unto his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. She is right in mine eyes, as it means. As the margin says, but his father and mother, it says, knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines for at that time the Philistines had domination over Israel. Now, as this is positioned in chapter 14, we could come to a, a summation and say that perhaps the mum and dad, this, this journey and this request from Samson is divine in many ways and it's far above his mum and dad's understanding. And there might be an element of, of, of truth to it in that Samson is going to go down into Timnath and take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines so that he might get occasion with them. And that appears to be perhaps the way it's written. The, that may be the case. However, a challenge for me in that thinking was that it's not supported by mum. See, mum was separate. And here it says that you go to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines 
they go and move to say, well, hang on, this is a vastly on the, on the spectrum of where you should be. This is the opposite end, Samson. It's almost like being led into, into temptation's way in some way, isn't it? But they couldn't, perhaps they couldn't understand it. I certainly don't have the definitive answer. What I do know and what I believe from what we're told is that every man, it says, as James would say, is drawn away of his own lust and, his, and, and enticed. We're all, it's all capable within all of us, isn't it, to fall short and to get drawn away. And whether we want to look at this story as being an example of what not to do, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. All these things were written aforetime for our admonition and our learning. They're all laid out there. We have small pockets of time in his life to look at. And whether it's about the things that he did do, and we perhaps there's a greater understanding of what God's doing here that his parents weren't aware of. Right? And God did drag him into all of those circumstances because he had occasion. Or whether it's just the fact that Samson, in the end, would just be drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Why? Because she pleases me well, Dad. She is right in my eyes, Dad. And surely if it was a work of God, would he not sit down and explain it to his mother who he shared the Nazarite vow with and say, this is what God wants me to do. Either way, God in heaven seeks occasion and he's going to use Samson as that tool, as that vehicle to, to bring occasion. Why? And this is the point more than anything at the end of verse 4, for at that time the Philistines had domination over Israel. They dominated them. They were subservient to the Philistines, so much so that they wanted to coexist with the Philistines. And God had to do something about it. And he would do something about it by way of this man's life. Then Samson, it says, went down and his father and his mother to Timnath. And they come to the, tim to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roars against him. Now Samson's on his own when this happens. We know that because he doesn't actually tell his mum and dad about the lion or the incident at all. It says a bit later on, he, he, he told them not what he had done. He'd taken out the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So as Samson is walking along, going down to Timnath, it says that a young lion roars against him. Here he is in the vineyard. So Samson, with the locks on his hair, and how many did he have? He had seven. We know that from Judges 16 because Delilah took all seven. So he had seven locks, that covenant number with God. He had seven locks of hair that represented the unpruned vine in the seventh year that was to rest and be given back to God. So there's all the symbology in the man's life and he's walking down. He's walking in a vineyard of all places and there he is, and a lion roars against him, it says. It means to startle. And the word there, roared, means a meeting. So it's almost got like God has brought the two together in the place of the vineyard, the very thing that Samson represents, that separation, and there's a lion there. And why on earth would there be a lion in the vineyard? We made reference in, in Judges 13 about what Israel were to do with their vineyards and their, their places where they would grow their crops, but protect them. And now that the Philistines have domination over Israel, all of the protection of everything that is within Israel is all broken down, hasn't it? The Philistines wander freely in the land. The Danites had not taken back their, their, their assigned portion. They didn't have an area to call their own. The Philistines would wander all the way through there. They were, they were dominating the men of Judah and they admit that later on when they betray Samson into the hands of the Philistines. And now there's a lion in the vineyard and Samson's walking along. You can picture him as he walks along between the vines and all of a sudden out of it, uh, out of the, the corner of his eye, he turns and he sees a lion and there's a meeting of the two, it says. It's almost like he startles the lion. The lion is so comfortable in the vineyard and wasn't the Philistines comfortable? Oh, they were comfortable as they walked up and down Israel. They were completely at home building their strongholds here, their strongholds there. 
And it was this man raised up for a purpose to come against the Philistines and he startles this comfortable lion in the vineyard of God, that, that, that lamb. And what does he do with it? It roars against him, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon him and he rent him uh, as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hands, but he told not his father and mother what he'd done. It says, and the Spirit of God comes mightily upon him in this moment. You know, this is the first recorded time specifically that this happens to Samson. Can you imagine what it was like, if indeed this is the first time, for him to experience that feeling? I wonder what it was like. We're talking about a person here that had superhuman strength. Really, one of the few people in the scripture that could, that could do these sorts of things. He goes on to do far bigger and greater things with this strength, doesn't he? We know. But this is the sort of thing we're talking about here. He would feel it within himself, I think. He would feel like what it's like to be charged of God almost. You know, it's said of the Lord Jesus Christ when, when uh, the, the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. Remember it said he felt virtue or, or spirit go out of him. He felt what it was like to have that healing power go into that person and immediately she's healed. He felt what it was like to go. This man feels what it's like for it to come into him. And I, I can only imagine it would be an intense and, a, and an amazing feeling. And there he is and suddenly he has the courage to take on this, this 200 kilo lion there. Right there in front of him, the spirit comes on him and he rents him as though he would have rent the, just the smallest of animals. He grabs hold of this line and he overpowers it. And you can imagine him putting his arms, the biceps around the throat of the thing and squeezing the life out of it and lowering it to the ground. And all the spirit suddenly leaves him and he sits there and he looks at just what he's been able to accomplish. It would have been blown his own mind of what had just happened. And he doesn't tell a soul about it. He tells not his father and mother what he'd done. Look at what he's able to do with God in his life, brothers and sisters. Such a simple little lesson, isn't it? If, if, if God be for us, who can be against us, David said. And what did he do? David went out and overthrew Goliath, didn't he? And there's a big lesson as, it, as all this ties in because there is the lion, lion representative of the Philistines, walking the length and breadth of that land and it's comfortable. And God raises up a man that he has a purpose with the Philistines for and he's demonstrating to Samson that when I am with you, look at what you can achieve. You can go and overthrow that lion just like that, just like it was the smallest thing. You can squeeze the life out of it, put it on the ground. There's the lesson for you. David learned that, didn't he? David knew if God can be for us, who can be against us? And he walked out and that Philistine, that 10-foot Philistine held the entire nation captive. And one person went out and said, with God's power, I can do this. And he went out and he overthrew it. And we know in our lives and in our walks right now, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, can't we? All things. And this might look like an, an impossible lesson for, uh, for Samson. It might look like to anyone else in Israel impossible that they could drive out the Philistines, but it's not. God's telling him this is the time to act. When David went out to, the, to, to meet, Phil, the, to meet uh, Goliath, rather, and he stood there and the man's all covered in brass, a symbol of the flesh, 10 foot tall with the whole nation in his palm. God's teaching him a lesson that he, together they can get uh, overthrow this man. But do you know what? Goliath started when he was this big. Goliath was born into the world exactly the same way that anyone else come into the world. This big. And the problem was allowed to grow and grow and grow and grow until in the end it's 10 foot tall and it ruled the nation, didn't it? Just like us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and sometimes our problems just start small and we don't address them when they're tiny, when we can overthrow them and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until in the end they're giants 
and they dominate us. They're like lions and they roar in our lives and they get comfortable. And our problems just walk up and down our spiritual vineyards right through our lives doing whatever they want. And yet we have to stop and remember and realize that through Christ we can do anything. We can overcome anything. And here's the message for Samson, loud and clear. You're in the vineyard, representative of the unpruned vine, the, the covenant you've made with me. And right there is something you need to overthrow and we're going to do this together. But he tells no one and continues on his way to Timnath and he talks with a woman, it says, and she pleases Samson well. She pleases Samson well. And it's not just that, that first time, that reference to the way Samson likes to be spoken to. Samson was, a very, was, a, was an avid listener, particularly to girls that he was interested in. He was an avid listener. It seems that he would often fall deaf to the messages that God would send him. But if you wait for Judges chapter 16, God willing, on Monday morning, you'll see that the way he listens to Delilah is everywhere. And she pleases Samson well with what she says in verse 7. And after a time, in verse 8, he returned to take her. So there's a period of time where they leave Timnath and they go back home and he returns now to take her to wife. And he, it says, and he returns to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. He turns aside. You know, this little uh, uh, event in his life has clearly gem generated enough interest for him to go and check it out again. There's a considerable period of time because he kills the lion and then by the time he comes back, the lion is decomposing. We know that from this story. So there's, there's, a, there's a period of time here and he, off he goes and he's not going to tell his mum and dad again. So he goes and he turns aside and to see the carcass of the lion and behold, there's a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof with his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So he goes and leaves home and he turns aside to go and see this carcass and lo and behold, there he is, walking through the vineyard and he hears probably before he sees the swarm of bees buzzing around this carcass and he gets there and he turns aside to see the bees and there's honey in the carcass. Now I'm no beekeeper at all, maybe there is beekeepers here, but I am quite sure that the last place that bees are going to choose to build a hive would be inside a dead animal. And yet there it is. And there's great symbology in this. God's screaming at him because not only is he able to overthrow the enemies when the Spirit of God is working in his life, but God's telling him that inside overthrowing this enemy is your inheritance, which is what honey is a symbol of. There it is right there. He says, you can go and take if you over, overthrow these Philistines with both of your hands, your inheritance, because they hadn't done it yet, had they? The assigned portion belonged to the Philistines. And he's saying, you go down there and take it back with both of your hands. And he took thereof and he went on eating and he came and what did he give to his mother and his father? He gave them honey to eat and they ate it. Honey, that symbol of inheritance one of the only substances on the earth, they say, that if stored correctly, never goes off, does it? It sustains life too. Honey is, is, is an amazing product of, of bees. Bees are amazing little animals, they're little insects that, that produce this stuff. We don't have time to go into the, the uh, importance of honey in the story. But at the end of the day, his parents ate it. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. There's his purpose, isn't it? There's his calling. There's God's occasion that he seeks with the Philistines to get Samson to overthrow them so they can have their inheritance back. So this domination of the people can stop. There is, that's what he's trying to tell him. And in verse 10, so his father went down unto the woman and Samson made there a feast. 
if we said in our last study together, we, don't, we can't really be sure why, but mum stays home. Samson directs his conversation to his father. He wants to get his point. She pleases me well, dad. This is what I want to do, dad. And eventually mum stays home and dad goes down. And they make a feast. The word feast means mishteh in the Hebrew. It means to drink. For so the young men used to do. And there is a great feast that's put together. Samson is there. And we would have to ask ourselves just how separate is he in this moment in his story. And it came to pass, it says in verse 11, when they saw him, that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Oh, I don't know how you read that, brothers and sisters, but I, I sort of read it like on two, two fronts. One, he's at his own wedding and he has no one else to go with him. So he's literally the only person at his own wedding with her. But also perhaps they're a bit worried. We don't know of Samson's reputation to this point. We only may only have these snippets of, of his life, but there seems to be there very quickly to put 30 men around him. And they call and it's sort of like dial a friend. In they all come. And now he gets to do what Samson enjoys. You can see he enjoys it in the scripture. He enjoys these sorts of moments where he gets to make a feast just like the young men used to do. And Samson says unto them in the middle of this feast in verse 12, I will now pour forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly declare it uh, to me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. Samson is about to put forward the very circumstance that he'd just gone through to see if they can guess it. You can see the work of God is work, whirling around in his mind, can't you? These, these moments that he's coming up against, these experiences he's having, the lessons are starting to call out to him. And he says, if you can do it within seven days, the man is surrounded by that number. His whole life is a covenant, isn't it? And within seven days, he says, I'll tell you what I'll give you. In the middle of this big feast, he says, I'll give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garment. Now, in this day and age, this is very, very expensive. Very expensive uh, clothing. So you typically have two sets, one inner and one outer. And you would often only have those two or, or perhaps a change. But people wouldn't have multiple um, sets of these sorts of clothes in their, in their wardrobe. We know that, that a little later on, when this, is, when this is talked about in terms of what he's going to have to pay out in verse 16, if you have a look, it says in the end of verse uh, 15, so, sorry, it says, have you called us to take what we have? So when they're speaking to Samson's wife, they're talking about this, this, this bet that he's made. And what would happen if we actually have to pay out on the 30 sheets and the 30 changes of garments, the margin says it will impoverish us. In other words, we're going to be broke. So every, uh, everyone at the wedding is suddenly realizing the weight of this bet that he's made is large. And Samson is, is a big gambler like that, isn't he? He's going to gamble big on this one. Is if you can guess this, because there's no way that you can guess this in the back of his mind, he hasn't told anyone. He hasn't even told his mum and dad, much less this woman. He's not told his wife. So in other words, it's a sure bet, it's secure. And here they are at this big drinking feast and he's going to make a bet with them that they're not going to be able to guess. And they say, in verse, uh, at the end of verse 13, Put forth your riddle that we might hear it. Go on, you tell us then. And you can imagine, I paint the picture in my mind of him standing up in the middle of his own wedding, getting everyone to quiet down, a boisterous occasion that it would have been. And he says, right, if you can guess this, I'll owe you 30. But if, if you can't, then you owe me. Is everyone on board? Yep. And a big cry goes out amongst all the lads. Yeah, yeah, you tell us. No problem. He goes, okay. Everyone's quiet. And he says, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And it says, and they could not 
three days, expand the riddle. You imagine them all hearing it first. Mm. Just think, how do we work this out? All right, all right, we've got time. Why? The feast goes for seven days. Another reference to seven. It's a long period of time. So but they've got time on their side. It's the food and the wine will continually roll out. And they start working out. But as the days pass, they work out. They might be in real trouble here. They might not be able to work this one out. And it says, and it come to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he might declare unto us the riddle. Lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire, have you called us to take what we have? Is it not so? Now, in actual fact, it, it's a slight contradiction in verse 17. It says, and she wept before him the seven days or the rest of the seven days. So it appears that they came to Samson, uh, to, sorry, they came to Samson's wife, not on the seventh day, but perhaps during the course of the feast because then she weeped for the rest of the seven days. So after about the three days at the end of uh, verse 14, and in three days they could not work the riddle out, they then turn to a different tact. The different tact is to go after Mrs. Samson. So that's exactly what they do. Entice thy husband. That word means to open. So open thy husband that he might declare unto us the riddle. You know, the same language is used later on in chapter 16. They want to entice Samson and they go by way of Delilah. Entice him that we might know and look at the sort of company he's keeping. Lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you come to take what we've got? In other words, are you a part of this as well? The tone of the wedding halfway through takes a, a completely different approach, doesn't it? Now this is aggressive. They've just threatened to burn her whole family and her to death in the middle of her own wedding. No wonder she's crying at Samson's feet. She's, her very life is now under threat because of something that her new husband has got up, a, a deal that he has made. And so it says in verse 16, And Samson's wife wept before him and says, You do but hate me, and you love me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people. You notice that. These are my people. They're not Samson. Samson's separate. Should he be there? These are the children of my people, he says. And you've not even told me of the riddle. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it to my father and my mother. And shall I tell it to you? I haven't even told my mum and dad the secret to this one. And she wept before him the seven days, and Samson couldn't handle it, could he? While the feast lasted, the seven days, or the rest of the seven days, you imagine being at your own wedding with your new wife and all she's doing the entire time is crying in front of people or crying out the back. And you're just trying to have fun. And day after day, because they went for so long, breakfast, lunch and dinner, she won't stop bawling her eyes out and, and it just wore him down and she would try everything. The same woman that with her words pleased him well, she will still get what she wants in the end. She plays on his emotional state. How can you say you, you, that we're in love? He never does to her. He never tells her he loves her, it's at least not recorded. But she said, you must hate me and you mustn't love me because you won't tell me. And plays on that emotional side of him until in the end, it says in verse 17, that she lay sore upon him. It got so much that she reverted to physical tactics of laying sore upon him at his feet, you can imagine her, pulling on his, on his dress there, right, at his own wedding, just saying, you've got to tell me. And he is in control, isn't he? And it says and she, uh, that he told her because she lay sore upon him and she quickly told the riddle to the children of her people. There's connections in that language all the way through. The language of separation, brothers and sisters, is very clear through the story of her people and his mission, of what he should be doing and where he should be separate to and where he shouldn't. 
And it says, And the men of the city said unto him in the seventh day, before the sun went down. It's almost like they waited just at the conclusion, late in the afternoon, as the sun's beaming through that wedding feast. They wait right till the end. They're so confident in what they've got that they, again, call for hush over the wedding. And in the same forum, perhaps, the same manner in which Samson delivers that riddle, they then all stand up and a spokesperson says, we think we've got the answer. And there's Samson, so full of confidence, wouldn't think that his wife had betrayed him. He says, yeah, what is it? And they say, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And I can see Samson in disbelief that they would work this out. And now he is faced with the, with the task of delivering on that, on that uh, debt that, he's, that he has, on that bet that he's made. And he says, if you had not ploughed with my heifer, you would have not found out my riddle. In other words, if you'd not done something to my wife that you shouldn't have, because you weren't to yoke the, the, the heifer or plough with it. You weren't to do that. And he's referencing saying, you have forced her to do something that she would not ordinarily do. That's what you've done. That's the only way you know. And in verse 19, it says, and the spirit of the Lord came, <coughs> excuse me, came upon him. And where does he go but Ashkelon? This moment here, he goes down to Ashkelon. And it's not like Ashkelon was close. Ascalon, some a two-day journey from where he is. And now the Spirit works in his life and he's off and he's going down to Ascalon. Ascalon means marketplace or, or weighing place. So he goes down to the marketplace, right, to the place where they, where they conduct all of their business. And it says, and he goes and he slays 30 men. Now, interestingly, if it was a marketplace, he could probably go down there and buy those things. However, no. He does go to the marketplace, but he goes shopping, doesn't he? And he kills people for it. And in he goes, with God working in his life, he goes down to Escalon, he slays 30 men and took their spoil and gave the change of garments unto them that expanded in the riddle. And his anger was kindled, it says, and he went up to his father's house. He went down there. It's almost like he went down into Timnath and he got bitten in some ways and he went back home. And he brings forth the garments, doesn't he? Can you imagine him walking back into his own wedding feast? At the conclusion of that feast as they're cleaning up and he walks back in with those people in there with an armful of bloodied garments that he'd killed people to take off and he drops them on the floor. He says, there's your, there's your garment. You wouldn't have got this if you hadn't have ploughed with my heifer, if you hadn't made my wife do something she didn't want to do. And Samson's wife, it says, was given to his companion, who he, whom he had used as his friend. He went to that wedding with no one. And he needed a best man or, or someone to, to be there alongside him. And this girl is given to that person. Samson ends up with nothing. It came to pass a bit time later in chapter 15 of verse 1. Within a while, it says, in the time of the wheat harvest, the seasonal change in this story, that Samson visited his wife with a kid and he says, I will go into my wife into the chamber. But her father would not suffer, it says, and uh, would not suffer him to go in. And her father says, verily, I thought that you hated her from the way you treated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. You remember your mate that was there? This is many months later. He comes back now to consummate the marriage, to take the wife. See, Samson is intent on making her his wife. This wasn't just about going and killing people at Escalon and God calling a purpose. He wants to marry the woman. He comes back. He, you see what he brings? He brings a kid. This is, this is just like Manoah brought a kid to have fellowship with the angel of God that announced his arrival. Samson wants to go now and, and have fellowship in that house and seek seek. Uh, forgiveness for the way he conducted himself. And he says, I will go into my wife, into the chamber. We'll start over again. We'll consummate our marriage and start our life together, it seems. But no, she's been given to someone else. What about her sister? Is she not younger and fairer? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. 
And Samson said concerning them, Now I shall be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. The NIV renders it, though This time I have the right to get even with them. I will really harm them this time, as the NIV says. And Samson then turns his attention in verse 4. And Samson goes out and he goes fox hunting, doesn't he? Samson is about to destroy the entire economy of the Philistines. have uh, a special time this morning, don't we, brothers and sisters, to remember the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and not only that, his death, but also his resurrection. And this morning, our study together will be with that in mind and take on somewhat of a slightly and more important meaning, of course, as it should. However, what we are going to do is continue to, to tell our story. And we've been amazed, haven't we, and through Judges 13 about the power that was contained in that chapter in the emphasis of the seed of the woman. And here we have the man that would crush that serpent's head laid out before us, that golden thread that goes all the way through Scripture. And we started to follow the man that would come out of that woman, Samson. We saw some of the struggles that he had in, in chapter 14 yesterday about, about he, him being, being able to be taken away by his own lust and, his, and enticed. He gets a little distracted on, on the purpose that God has called him to. And yet, all the way through this story, as we've highlighted, isn't it incredible that our Father in heaven is there constantly for him? And that no matter what, his purpose would prevail in this man's life. And the Heavenly Father would wait there patiently as Samson time and time again would just make what seems to be just those smallest yet great impact issues and, and problems that he would come up against. He would make those mistakes and God would be there waiting for him. And chapter 15 and some of the lessons we're going to consider this morning really is no different, is it? We left Samson yesterday after speaking with the woman of Timnath's father, the one that he would go and marry. And he would go back there after some time, it says, in chapter 15 and verse 1. There's been a change of seasons. It says, in the time of the wheat harvest. And that's important for us to remember because what he's about to do, it, it is right in the middle of when everything is ready to be picked. He is going to single-handedly take out their economy in the next few verses. And he comes and he, and he wants to, with a kid of the goats, it says, and he comes and he wants to go and consummate that marriage in verse 1. And the father says that he's given her away, but then perhaps you'd like to, to marry the sister instead. And he's very upset. And he says, now will I be blameless in verse 3, more than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And what does he do in verse 4? It says, and Samson went out and caught 300 foxes. Now, we don't know if they're foxes. Uh, the, the word perhaps suggests maybe some sort of wild dog or wild animal. Either way, it would be very difficult for him to catch 300 foxes. Now, this is also a chance for us to, in some ways, let our minds wander about how he actually did these things. Maybe he had help to get them. Maybe he came up with a plan to, to catch them all in one space. Whatever it is, the man is very concentrated on what he's doing. He's got his single, singleness of mind that he will go out and he is going to do this Philistines a displeasure. And wasn't that God's purpose with him? Didn't God seek an occasion for these very things to take place? He did. And now Samson is in action and it says he catches 300 foxes and he puts firebrands uh, in between their tails. He turns them tail to tail and puts the firebrand right in the middle of the two tails. Now that word firebrand is the same word used in, in Judges chapter 7 
to, to describe Gideon's lambs. And as we see the same tools being used throughout the period of the judges. And he would grab these animals and turn them side by side, uh, tail to tail, and he'd put the firebrand in there and he'd let them go. And you paint the picture of what this would have looked like in verse 5. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and it burnt up the shocks and the standing corn and the vineyards and the olives. And you can see Samson lighting these things and letting them go through all of the dry fields that are now ready to harvest. It's at the time of the harvest, verse 1 says. And pair after pair run off until in the end the, the brand drops out between their tails and a great fire starts right across the countryside and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it burns up all of their corn, it says, and the shocks and the standing corn and the vineyards, these things take decades and decades to grow. Olive groves take hundreds of years and it's all destroyed in one moment. And what would they later say about this moment in their history? You know what the Philistines would say when they brought him out before, before them to parade him in front of all of them at a, at a great feast at the end of his life? They said, bring out the destroyer of our country. That's how they saw Samson. One man was beginning to erode and destroy everything that they knew and understood. One man of superhuman strength would cause them to question their own power and might in his presence. And now their economy is decimated. There would be a food shortage right across the region, a food shortage for the Philistines and for their men, thanks to one man. And they, they want answers, don't they? Look what they say in verse 6. It says, then the Philistines said, who has done this? And you can imagine them calling a, an emergency meeting of all of their elders, the five lords of the Philistines perhaps, rulers of the five cities in that area. And they would get together in the middle of the night as the smell of fire would waft across their entire country trying to put the fires out and they would hold an emergency meeting to say, you tell us who's responsible. And look what they say in verse 6. And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, and they even offer a reason, they say, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And now he's upset. And look what the Philistines do. In an instant there, in that war room, they, can make, they make the decision. And they send people to say, you go and find that man and you go and find his wife and you kill them both. And that's what they do. And the Philistines came up, it says, and burnt her and her father with fire. Do you know what? That's what they promised to do to her if she didn't share the secret. You see the sort of people that they were. Remember, they threatened her at her own wedding. If you don't tell us, we're going to burn you. So she told them. Remember what she called them? They're children of my people. That's her own people that have done that to her. And in the end, that's what happens to her. And you can see that band of soldiers turning up to the house and dragging her out the front and setting her on fire alive. They did that to her. That's the children of her people, as she describes them. And Samson hears of this and says unto them, Though you have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will see Samson warring with his purpose. He says, I will stop once I am avenged of this act that you've done unto me. You imagine how he felt. Whilst it never says that Samson loves the woman of Timnath, clearly he felt very strongly about her. He went back at the start of chapter 15 to consummate the marriage. And, and for all we know, had not the purpose of God interrupted his life, maybe stay there. He went back to finish what was started after that wedding. And yet now she's gone and he clearly feels very strongly about it. And in verse 8, look what it says, and he smote them hip and thigh. And here's a man that's just had the news. His wife has been killed and her family. And he's angry and there's chaos through this whole part of the land and he goes out and he smotes them limb on limb is what the expression means. Limb on limb, pile on pile. With a great slaughter, this man goes out full of rage. And he takes revenge into his own hands and he lays these men, these Philistine soldiers, one on another on another. 
And it says, and when he went down, after that moment, he went down and he dwelt in the top of the rock Etam. Etam means hawk ground. It almost gives an idea of he's got some sort of vantage point of what he can see. And I, and I can see it in my mind's eye. This man, he goes down and he picks the perfect spot that he can see over all the land and he watches it burn with bodies piled up around him. There he is. He's taken, <coughs> taken revenge <coughs> for those things that they would do unto him is what he'd said. And now he will cease. And the Philistines, brothers and sisters, had to offer some sort of response, did they not? And that's what they do, excuse me, in verse 9. It says the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. Now the following few verses, brothers and sisters, and particularly young people, are very, very interesting in the life of Samson. You follow along and see who's saying what here, what really is going on. So the Philistines come up and they pitch in Judah, it says, and they spread themselves out in Lehi, which means jaw, which we'll, we'll see a bit later on. And the men of Judah come, uh, say, why are you come up against us? And they say to bind Samson and we come up to do to him what he has done to us. You see, that back and forth conversation about I will do to you and the other side says, well, we're now going to do back to you. That happens all the way through this story between Samson and the Philistines. Back and forth. I will be revenged now because you've done this. We're going to come and do this to you because you did it before to us. It goes back and forth. And in the end, that's what Samson says. Avenge me for mine eyes. That's what the story is laced with, is this, this war between these two sides. And so... Have you noticed that the men of Judah come to the Philistines? They say, why are you come up against us? So there's no great retaliation. Remember we said at the beginning that the Philistines had domination over Israel. This is the very reason that God sought occasion. Because something had to be done. They've got domination over them. It's verses like this that prove that because there's no great fight. The Philistines come in, they settle in the valley. And then out come the men of Judah and the Philistines and they come and talk with each other. They say, why are you here? And they say, well, we have come to bind Samson. Are we come to do to him what he's done to us? So in between verse 10 and 11, very clearly a conversation takes place between Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah, the men there and the Philistines. And, and something takes place there for them to say, well, you let us go and do this work. Just wait there. We don't want you to go and get him. We'll go and get him. Because it says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went up to where Samson was, right up to the top of Etam. And they came. They said to Samson, Look what they say. Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? You know, that's the very reason they had domination, because that's how Israel saw them. Remember yesterday we alluded to that this domination of the Philistines and that, that type of sin and flesh as having domination over us at times. And when, when these things start small, they can grow into very great problems, can't they? Just like the Philistine domination over Israel. We, we alluded to, the, to the, uh, the type of Goliath in David's life in the time of Israel. A small problem growing very big until in the end it dominated the whole, uh, whole land. This is why. Because they turn around and they say, well, they are our rulers. There they are pleading with the man that would begin to deliver Israel to say to him, this is not how this works. You know, have we stopped fighting some of the bigger things that really challenge us? Are we learning to, and do we learn at times, to coexist with those problems? Still in the end, that they're the things that, although we might not like to admit it, they are the things that dominate us, that it is our ruler. And when God wants to come along and, and, and move in our life through way of time or circumstance or people or influence, we want to question that. And, and we say, well, I don't want to go against the norm. This is uncomfortable. And all the time, God is working in those moments, isn't he? 
to try and turn those uncomfortable things because he knows that in our lives, those things have domination over us. He knows where it ends. So he sends these signs and these people and times, circumstances along, whether it's trial or whatever it is. And the main cause and the purpose of them is to challenge the leadership, the rulership in our own personal lives. Is it him or is it the flesh? And they fail dismally here, don't they? Know you not that these people are rulers over us. What is it that you've done to us? You have caused us great discomfort. Now we have food shortage. Now we have more military activity than ever before. We were quite happy just coexisting here. And you've come along, you've caused all these things. And his response is, and he said unto them, as they did unto me, I did unto them. There it is again, back and forth, the war between the two sides. And look what happens in verse 12. It says, and they said unto him, we are come down to bind thee that we may deliver thee, deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. Samson says unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee and deliver thee into their hands. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. What a conversation that is. Brothers and sisters, that is his own brethren having that conversation with him. And who greater, uh, greater are we reminded of this morning than the Lord Jesus Christ, betrayed by his brethren, wasn't he? And did you notice the, 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 the change in ownership of this circumstance? In verse 10, the Philistines say to the men of Judah, to bind him are we come up. They take ownership. They say, we're going to come here and do this. And look at the change of ownership over in verse 12. We are come to bind you, Samson. That's his own brethren that said that. They've taken it and changed it, haven't they? We've come to bind you, that we may deliver you. And who does that remind you of? Perhaps, brothers and sisters, the words of Peter over at Pentecost. When Peter would lift up his voice and stand there, standing up amongst the eleven. You remember in Acts chapter 2. And what did he say? He said, in verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words. He'd say, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. And here is Samson, a man approved of God from the womb. And Peter would say, Jesus, a man approved of God among you, by what? By miracles and signs and wonders which God did by him in the midst of you. And you know it. And there's the men of Judah standing in front of a man approved of God by an angel who announced his birth, who would perform superhuman uh, feats of strength and leadership and overcome his enemies. And every single one of them knew it. Him being delivered, it says. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken this man raised up for a purpose to begin to deliver Israel, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Isn't it interesting? You have taken, and Peter says to all those people listening there, he says, by wicked hands you slew Jesus Christ. And there's the change in ownership there. Because the Philistines come and these men, the men of Judah, tie him up but they won't kill him themselves. They hand it to the, to the Philistines. And the Jews, Judas would betray the Lord Jesus Christ and the Romans would kill him. By wicked hands, they organized that killing. And so Samson, it says, is bound in verse 13 with two new cords and they brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines, it says, they shouted against him. Can you imagine him being brought up? 3,000 men went to get one man. They knew the signs and wonders that God was doing in his life. 3,000 men surround this one man and they bind him up, put his hands behind his back. You can imagine and out he comes. And he comes into full view of all those Philistines and they begin to roar like the, the roar of victory. 
and it gets louder and louder and louder as Samson is led down in amongst them all. And there are all the men of Judah and there are all the Philistines. There's thousands there gathered in one place. And look at the language. And the Philistines shouted against him. What does it remind you of? What was going through Samson's mind at this point, you think? Was it just the circumstance that he's here? Or was it the purpose that God's called him to? Because he had met this very circumstance some time before, perhaps a year or two before, when he was walking through a vineyard. And he met the lion. And what did it, what did it do? He startled the lion and it says, the scripture tells us, it roared against him. And here it is. The roar of the Philistines right in his face. The message from God. The, the, the occasion that God would seek with Samson and the Philistines is right in this moment and he'd been told all about it before. And the same thing happened as when he overthrew the lion. What happened? The spirit of the Lord come mightily upon him. You imagine that feeling as he's standing there and suddenly he feels it within himself. He's felt this before at least twice in his life, once in Eshkelon. And once fighting a lion, and now it comes over him. He can feel it all within himself. And he flexes and, and takes those flaxes straight off his arms, loosed off his hands, like they're burnt with fire, it says. And he looks around and he finds a, a new jawbone of an ass, it says, and he put forth his hand and he takes it. And you know, in the last few lines of this verse, where we have to be doing what God's intended us to do with this book, which is plug your imagination. However you see these few verses, uh, these few lines taking place, allow your mind to think, young people, think about what might have happened here. We don't know what the, the area looked like, the land, how many people were there. All we can assume is that there is thousands of people in this spot. And he's looked around and he's seen this bone, anything to be able to get an extension of his right hand. And he reaches down. And it was probably no longer than about that, which meant it was close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And perhaps he backed himself into a space where, where, where he couldn't, uh, people couldn't get it behind him. And he would stand there and one by one he would start meticulously going through and removing these people from the face of the earth. The Spirit of God working in him. He would have to get close and bash them. And the blood of his enemies would splash all over him. And it says, and he saw a thousand men there with. You imagine the roar as they kept on coming and kept on coming. And one man there, what a sight it would have been to see, brothers and sisters, the spirit of God in one man as he there would smash his enemies and lay them body on body, heap on heap with their blood running down his garment until in the end the tide of the battle would turn and the Philistines would shake their head in disbelief. They couldn't believe what they were seeing, superhuman strength. And in the end they would retreat. All, brothers and sisters, witnessed by his own brethren. They were there too. And look what Samson does. He says, with, with the jawbone of an ass, he says, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. He stands there with this jawbone in his, in his hand. And what's the significance of it? You notice it says that he found a, a new jawbone. In the margin it says a moist jawbone. That the word only occurs a, a couple of times new there. And it's got to do with purification or purifying. It's, uh, sorry, putrefaction. It's breaking down. It's rotting. So you've got this bone with, with what is a little bit of life left on it. But in the hands of the right person, look what it's able to do. And here's another lesson from God for Samson. Him saying there is that, that the representation of Israel laying there almost dead. But in the man who would pick it up, driven by the purpose of God, with the spirit in him, it could overcome his enemies. And in that small bone is on its own, it's weakness. But in the hands of that man, with God working in him, it became strong and it overthrew his enemies. Do you know it's a theme through Judges? Deliverance through the weak. You consider the tools that God uses in Judges to deliver Israel. A left-handed man. 
in those days, not considered as we know the, the, um, the type of the right hand, the strength of the right hand. Yet God would deliver through the, through the strength of a left-handed man. He would use an ox goad. He would use a woman. He would use a nail. He would use a millstone during this period of time. He would use a pitcher and a trumpet. He would use a jawbone. All things in and of themselves in that time, in that period of time, considered weak inside of a greater enemy. And yet in the hands of God, working in those people's lives through the, through the weakness, he is made strong. Samson is being told a lesson there. Grab Israel. You can overthrow the enemy. Grab hold of them. The jaw, steer them. That's how you move the animals. Steer them in the right direction. Overcome the, uh, the enemies. And yet Samson stands there. You look what he says in verse 16. With this jawbone of an ass, this weak thing, he's going to miss the point, isn't he? He says, with this, heaps upon heaps, I have slain a thousand men. I've slain them. I've slain a thousand men. And he would stand there. Can you see the bodies around him? He's blood red with the, that, those, that blood of his enemies. And he would stand and he would throw away that jawbone, it says. He cast it away. And when it came to uh, it came to pass when he made an end of speaking, he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and he called the place Ramath Lehi. And he stood there. And what does God do? And immediately he's thirsty. You know, it's almost at that point in verse 18, you can imagine that spirit power that had come mightily upon him began to leave his body. And suddenly the fatigue of fighting hand to hand combat with a thousand men that would go for hours and hours and hours, eventually back to his normal physical human state, without the spirit within his body. He would be exhausted. And you can see here that the fatigue washes over him without the hand of God in his life to overcome his enemies. And he's sore of thirst. It's so much so that he cries out to God. He says, Thou hast given the great delivery. Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hands of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. They're going to come back and they're going to get me. And there he is laying on the ground. And he says, you have given it to me. And that's what God wanted to hear. See, Samson missed the point, didn't he? He got a bit carried away and he forgot where this victory had come from. But God, they're listening, listening to him, never leaving his side, no matter what circumstance he gets into. It says, clave and hollow place that was in the jaw or in Lehi, in that place that he'd named Lehi, right there. And it says, there came water there out. And you can imagine Samson laying on the ground as the, the stream begins to, to run across the ground and just runs into the side of his face and he slowly begins to suck away at that water. Sheer exhaustion. And he begins to drink that which God provides to him. And aren't we reminded, brothers and sisters, of the words of uh, Revelation chapter 21, which we know well. It says, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That is he who we remember this morning, brothers and sisters, the greater than Samson. What an amazing moment in this man's life, brothers and sisters. What an amazing victory was wrought at the hand of Samson by way of the Spirit of God working mightily in his life. And yet, like many of us at times, when we overcome, we forget too, don't we, just how big a part that, that Spirit of God can play in our life, that relationship we have with His Son. And Samson had forgotten it, but he'd be reminded that it is through God comes salvation, as we are reminded this morning. And what does he do next, brothers and sisters? It says, then Samson, well, he goes to Gaza. And in chapter 16, he goes down now to the stronghold, almost renewed 
in spirit on, of his victory. The tide of this battle is starting to turn as, as the Philistines are really beginning to think, are they actually able to overthrow this man? Too many victories now has, has gone Samson's way. And Samson wants to capitalize on, on this moment, it says, and he goes to Gaza, the fortified place. Now he's going to head, it's almost like their capital city. And he goes down there and he sees a harlot, it says, and he goes in unto her. And you know what? Have a look in verse 2. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is here. And they compassed him about. And they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall see him. Uh, we shall kill him, it says. And you look at the circumstance that this man finds himself in. He's gone in now in, at night time. It's midnight. Look in verse 3, Samson lay till midnight and he arose at midnight. It is now midnight. Do we remember what his name means? But brilliant sunlight. And there's a man in the darkest time of the night who comes off an incredible spiritual high with his, with his father in heaven, overthrowing the enemy. Now that light extinguished in the darkness, isn't it? It's swallowed up by the darkness in this moment, in this moment in his life. He goes from up here to down there. And it says, and they compassed him in. And they laid wait for him. And they're quiet all the night. Stark contrast to what David would write in Psalm 32. When he would say, God, you are my hiding place. He says, you preserve me. You will compass me about. You will deliver me. That's what he says. And look at this man. The man that will begin to deliver Israel is now here, compassed about by his enemies in one of the lowest and darkest times of his life. And Samson, it says, lay until midnight and he arose. And you can see them all surrounding this place, just waiting for this opportunity, this moment that now they might have the victory over him. They've caught him at his weakest. They're starting to understand what makes this man work. What are the weaknesses he might have in his armor that they can exploit and they can get to. They're building this profile case on him because they deploy every single bit of knowledge against this man in the next chapter. Everything they've ever learned about battling this judge comes to the fore in Judges chapter 16. And they're doing their reconnaissance and they're working him out and out he comes at midnight in the, in the darkest of the night when they least expect. And he takes, it says, the doors and the gate of the city. You see the irony here. There's Samson locked away in the middle of the night in the place of decision as the gates were. That's what the gates represented in the city. The place they would gather and make their decisions and there he is in the gate of decision. And he is now going to exploit their weakest point because weren't the gates the weakest point in any fortified city? It was the only point that opened it closed. And he's there. And he grabbed hold of them. He took the gates of the city, it says, the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them on his shoulder. And what a victory that is to imagine this morning. As he goes out and he would put his back up against those gates, and you can imagine the soldiers standing around thinking, surely this isn't going to happen. For everything we've heard and everything we've seen, there is no way this is going to happen. And he would lift with all of his might and he would carry those gates, taking out the look at the detail, the beam that goes across and the posts as well, and would slowly, foot by foot, one step in front of another, it says he carried them away up the top of a hill, it says. And you can see that journey and the disbelief, the vulnerability, the exposure to his enemies, that their fortified place, their armory as it was, is now laid waste at the, the strength of one man. And where does he head? He heads to Hebron. And from great lows, brothers and sisters, the sunlight of the, of the earth, down, swallowed up in the darkness of those acts. Now, he grabs hold of the gates of his enemies 
and in, and in one foot in front of another, he heads to Hebron, a place of fellowship with his God, and he lays them down before Hebron. And you can imagine him rolling over on his back, sheer exhaustion. And for that moment, he has fellowship with his heavenly Father. We look to a time, don't we, brothers and sisters, where the greater than Samson will return to this earth and possess the gates of his enemies. And these words might be fulfilled. In Revelation 22, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. keep studying this man's life I think for weeks months on end there's so much uh, in this story and as there's been a lot of conversation this weekend which has been really the objective which is fantastic and I think it it goes to show that we read the Bible as someone said on the weekend we read the Bible uh, comparative to where we are in our life at the time and and the beautiful thing about the scripture is it is one book that was put together to fit all the generations and all the circumstances that all those generations would find themselves in. So even with stories like this, Samson, we will sit with a, a certain lens on Samson depending on where we are in our life. And, and that's certainly come out from all the discussion that we've um, been able to have together this weekend. So this morning, uh, our intention is to complete the story. And he is a wonderful character in the Bible, isn't he? And there's absolutely no doubt, it, chapter 16 is a culmination now of all of his challenges uh, coming together. The Philistines have learned a lot about this man over 20 years. And over this period of time of judgment, they've collated all those things, they've learned about the destroyer of their country, and now they're going to deploy them. And they're going to use one of the, the greatest people that, that is recorded in Scripture, really, in, in, in many ways. Infamous person that she is. In fact, there's, there's three people that share very similar characteristics inside the Old Testament, and Delilah is one of them. The first would have to be Potiphar's wife. Second would be Jezebel. And, of course, we have Delilah this morning. And and we won't go into detail as to how they intertwine, but just think and cast your mind back to those women in Scripture and the impact that they had on the people around them. And Samson is not going to be any different. And there was a man years later, Solomon, who would write in Proverbs chapter 7 some very interesting things about people just like this. And we won't read all of Proverbs 7, but we will open with a, a couple of words from it. In Proverbs 7, he says, My son, you keep my words and my, my commandments. And he said, I'll tell you why. Over in verse 5, he says, These commandments and words, he said, They will keep you from the strange woman, the stranger which flattereth with her words. And we've seen on more than one occasion that this is what got to Samson. His first wife pressed him and vexed him with her words, remember, day after day after day. And he goes on and he describes just what, what will happen if we don't guard our ears and our hearts from these strange words. He said, we, we become like young, young ones, void of understanding in verse 7. And he goes on and he paints this picture of a young man out in the street. And there is a woman with her words, watching this young man from, from her casement window. And Solomon, uh, who, who surely is, is educated enough and experienced enough to talk on these things with all the trouble that he got himself into, he says it's like a young person, void of understanding and in the twilight and in the evening and in the black and dark of night, 
Four ways to describe the night in one verse. Hadn't, hadn't Samson been there? And, and, he, and he goes on to say, she lies in wait at every corner. And eventually this young man that would walk the streets dark at night, void of understanding, not knowing how much danger he was in, she would come along and it says in verse 13, and she would catch him by the face. And she would look into his face and say, I have peace offerings with me. She would say, I have found you. In other words, it meant that she would make this man feel like she'd been looking for him his whole life. And he would just stare into her face. I have found you. I have perfumed my bed. Come and let us take our fill of love till morning. And in verse 21, with her much fair speech, the very warning that Solomon gives, she causes him to yield. And he, in verse 22, goes straight after her. You know what Solomon describes him as? Like an ox that goes to the slaughter. And he runs down that race and up the ramp, not knowing that on the other side of that door is death. He knows not, in verse 23, that the spot that he finds himself in is for his life. And that is where we find Samson in Judges chapter 16. And how do we know that? Well, you open there in verse 4, and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman. You know, it's, it's never said of anyone else in this story that Samson loved them like this woman. It's not said of anyone else, not even of his wife. He is in love. He looks into that face and he sees a woman that he loves, it says, in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, if you wanted to know what sort of person this was, just quickly skip over in a few verses in chapter 16 and put together in your mind the picture of influence that she has. Do you know, during this story, she has a direct line to the five most powerful people in all of that country, the lords of the Philistines. In fact, they ring her and when she wants something, they come running. She is highly, highly influential. She's exceptionally wealthy and particularly after this story, she cleans up real good from those five lords of the Philistines. She has this ability to persuade and coerce Samson like no one else in his life. And isn't it ironic, the bookends of his life, the two women, he had his mother who separated herself to God and would hedge him round about and train him and bring him up. And then he comes up against this woman on the other end of his life who will stop at nothing to pull down everything that's ever done. Bind me. She, uh, he would say, you try this and you try that. She would say, what would happen if I bind you? The word means to yoke or hitch. And he's already yoked to his God, isn't he? The, that separation on his head and she's there pulling the other way saying, I'm going to bind you to me. I'm going to take you away. This is the challenge. The two women, the book end of his life. And here he is and he's staring into his eyes and look where he is. He's in the valley of Sorek. And the divine irony is not lost in this verse. The valley of Sorek. Sorek means the choicest vine of all things. So there he is. He's in the valley of Sorek, the choicest vine. And on his head is a symbol of the unpruned vine. And all the messages are coming right there. And he's sit staring into the eyes of a woman named Delilah, whose name means that, that which hangs down, almost like the vine. There's vine everywhere, isn't it? The symbol of separation. He is in all sorts of trouble now because he loves her. And he's just going to listen to her. She will prevail. If she has his heart. And the lords of the Philistines, it says, came up to her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lies and by what means we might prevail against him that we might bind him. There it is. 
to afflict him. And, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. The lords of the Philistines come to her. Now, there's some suggestion that she may be uh, a Hebrew, just like Samson. And that, that suggestion is made because during chapter 16, she constantly refers to the Philistines as the Philistines. Samson, the Philistines are upon thee. A difference to the, the woman of Timnath that he married who would say that these are the children of my people. So she very much owned the Philistines as her people, whereas Delilah never does that. And, and perhaps that they're going to use Delilah in this way because she could build that trust and that, that, that almost that, that faux love with Samson that they could exploit that because she was one of his people. We don't know. Either way, she has great influence because the lords of the Philistines come to her and they say entice him. That word entice is to open up. And this is what the Philistines wanted to do. They gave the same charge to the woman of Timnath. And at the wedding, they said, you go and entice him. You open him up so we can work him out. What do they want to know? They want to see where in his great strength lies. They had not worked it out. That, of course, is also always a good talking point about how big Samson was and whether people could look at him and, and suggest that his strength came from uh, the size of the person that he was. And I guess they never kind of worked it out. It, obviously, he was a 10 foot tall and and rippling muscles, I kind of think he probably looks something like me, actually. <laughs> they couldn't work it out. And they say, say it a number of times down in verse 9. So his strength was not known. Uh, verse 15, these three times thou hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. So it was a mystery. And that's what they wanted to know. And they said to her, we want to know wherein his great strength lies. And how we can overcome him so that we might afflict him. They weren't backward in coming forward. They knew what they wanted to do. You see the margin says they want to humble him. They want to humble the boy. And look at the reward. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now this is what you call all the bets being, all the stops being pulled out. 1,100 pieces of silver, young people. He had already, many years before, destroyed their economy. They're only just starting to rebuild. And now they're going to get all the money they can and do it on one big bet, and that's Delilah. 1,100 pieces of silver. It's a bit difficult to work out exactly what it, what it perhaps would have been. But over in, in, in chapter 17, 10 shekels by the year in verse 10, seems to be, of Judges 17 verse 10, seems to be about the standard year's wage, which would mean that 5 by 1100 is 550 odd years salary. In other words, by today's standards, it could be upwards of 15 or 20 million dollars. In other, whatever we believe, it's more than likely going down and pulling everything out of the bank that those five lords of the Philistines had and placing it in the lap of Delilah. That's how confident they were that she could get the job done. That is an enormous amount of money. Do you know what, though? She's not interested in money. She's not just interested in money. You watch how the story unfolds. So she takes on this challenge. And in verse 6, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lies, and wherein thou mightst be bound to afflict thee. I always find this period of his life quite interesting because the way it's written, it stacks these events one after the other. It's almost like each night she asks him and the Philistines jump on him and then the next night she asks him again. And, and very clearly it wouldn't have happened like that. There's a long, there would be long periods of time between these challenges on his strength and her prying away at, at trying to work out where his secret is. You see, he has a great problem because over in verse 16, it's in order to paint the picture properly, you jump forward to, to verse 16 and it says, and it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. So we can draw perhaps the assumption from that 
that Samson lived with Delilah. The only way that she's going to get access to him every single day is if they're living together. And here's a greater problem that he's got. She's trying to yoke and hitch him to her way of thinking, to her, to her life. And she's very close to succeeding as the story builds. And now she wants to know, she asks him, where is it? What will we have to do in order to afflict you? Where does it lie? And Samson in verse 7 said, if you bind me or yoke me, as the word means, with seven green widths that were never dried, then I shall be a weak and as an ordinary man, as the word means. I'll be like anyone else. But you notice what he's done there? He gives the first clue. He just lets his guard drop just that little bit. He never let his guard drop with his wife, did he? At his own wedding, no way in the world. But he does here. Seven green widths. The seven. The covenant number. It's appeared all the way through the story, hasn't it? He knows that it's there. The seven green widths. Then the lords of the Philistines brought to her seven green widths. You see that? These are the rulers. This is the, the upper echelon of government government in this time and they come and personally deliver to her these green widths which had not been dried and she bound him with them and in verse 9 now there were men lying awake abiding in the chamber with her and however the 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 house was set up undoubtedly she's managed to hide a certain number of soldiers and is clearly here in, in full expectation that these green widths are going to work. Seven green widths, all these cords tied up. And she'd cause him to fall asleep and they'd be there together and she'd be able to tie them all up, full of confidence. And she's hidden these men, abiding with her in the chamber. And she says unto him, Samson, uh, sorry, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And we know the story. He breaks the widths as a thread of tow. When it touches the fire or smells the fire as a margin, just like taking a bit of string and just moving it near a flame and it would just fall away so easily, he pulls his arms out so his strength was not known. Can you imagine what it was like to be one of those soldiers in that room and you're told that this is definitely going to work and you're talking in your mind, you're thinking about a guy that has literally knocked off thousands of your mates. And now you've got to jump out there in the middle of the night and have all confidence to go and grab him. And you'd run in there and she'd make a great raucous and you'd run in and he'd stand up and do that and you'd turn around, I reckon, you'd be out the door in an instant. And his strength's not known. Now here is the key in verse 10 to this woman. Have a look. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, you have mocked me. You've mocked me. And you've told me lies. This is actually her problem. Delilah is not a woman that is used to being lied to. She does the manipulation, no one else to her. And she's devastated that he would do that. You have lied to me, she says. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou might be bound. You tell me. And you can imagine that conversation of those two people come together in that house and she'd look at him and she's, she's starting that emotional card, that emotional blackmail. You lied straight to my face. And there's Samson. He, this gets him every single time. It would claw away at his heart. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. She said, no, you tell me. You don't make a mockery of me in front of other people. She's got every bit of her reputation relying on this deal to get this over the line. Not only does she stand to make a lot of money, but she has the five most powerful people in all of the nation ringing her and placing great expectation on her. She needs to deliver and it won't happen when she's being mocked in her own house. And he says unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied or never, knew, never used, then I'll be like an ordinary man, as it means. And she does that. And of course, the Philistines are upon thee, Samson, and the liars in wait were abiding in the chamber, and he break off 
them off his arm, just slight thread. The same thing happens. And what's the first thing that Delilah says to Samson in verse 13? Hitherto you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me where thou might be with sorry, wherewith thou might be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. You see, he gives up a little more now. Not only is it seven green wits that if you tied me up, but now, now he alludes to his hair, the symbol of that covenant that he's got with his God, the symbol of separation. And as she is trying ever so slightly and incrementally to bind him and yoke him to one way of life, he's already yoked to another. And now he alludes to that. It's in my hair. If you weave the seven locks, seven, the covenant number of my head into the web and she fastened it, it says, with the pin into, the, into a, a, a contraption that would be used to make um, different garments or rugs or clothing and she, and, and she takes her hair and fastens it in with a pin and she says unto him, the Philistines be upon thee and he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. The whole insides of this contraption came away with his hair. How on earth she got him into a position to be able to put his hair in the first place into that? But she managed it. And then she really starts in verse 15. Have a look. How can you say, I love you when your heart is not with me? You see, she pinned points the problem how can you say that you love me and i don't have what's in here you have mocked me three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies you imagine the performance that was put on the tears and pulling at every bit of his heartstring how can you say that you love me the intense conversation inside that bedroom late at night staring into each other's eyes would just claw away at Samson's heart and it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, vexed unto death. Not to a point it was killing him. Every single day she would ask him. Every single day she would hold him ransom for his emotions and the way he felt about her. Every single day. You know, you pause that moment right there and who does that remind you of in the Old Testament? Reminds you of Joseph, doesn't it? It says exactly the same thing of Potiphar's wife. She saw something that she wanted. A handsome young man, blessed of God, who had everything in Potiphar's house, house in his hand. And she would press him daily, press him daily. She set circumstances in so that house where it was only him and her by themselves and she would corner him and she would press herself. It would be physical upon Joseph. And the two men at two different periods of time face exactly the same type of trial, exactly the same type of woman. Both men that are separated to God by time and circumstance. And yet they both react very, very differently, don't they? Because we know the story of Joseph in that he turns around and he flees idolatry, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And he leaves his coat right there. He runs out of the room. And what happens here? That he told her all his heart. And in the end, that constant wearing away could not possibly be kept off by Samson. And he tells her everything. And do you know, in, in Micah chapter 7 and verse 5, it says these words. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a God. He says, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lies in your bosom. He says, you watch your mouth from her that lies in your bosom, in your bed. And that's where they are, right there. And she finally gets to him and he told her all his heart. There has not come a razor on my head. For I have been separated unto God from my mother's womb. He knew full well, didn't he? He says, if I be shaven, 
Then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And was it really true, brothers and sisters? Was it really true that it was all tied up in his hair or was it what it symbolised? Of course it was. It was that symbolisation of being separated and called out to God, wasn't it? And he says, my strength will go and I will be like any other person. And do you know what's happened here, brothers and sisters? In, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and, and verse 4, uh, it's a little quote that you would know very, very well and you don't need to turn it up. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says these words, which were spoken to Israel. It says in verse 4, Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy might. Wasn't that what they were told to do? And here's a man that's separated to that God. And he was called to do exactly the same thing. And yet, do you know what he's done here? What he's done is he's replaced the God in his life. This is why his challenges are going to become so much worse now because what she does is she presses him daily with her words so much so that his soul, there it is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. She gives him his soul. That he told her all his heart, there it is, two out of three now, he offers up to her and in the end, with all thy heart, with all thy soul and now as he lays in her lap, he offers up the secret to his strength and the very thing that Israel was told to give to God, he gives to Delilah. You know what the very next verse says? And these words which I have commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart. And she had his heart, didn't he, from the very beginning. God, brothers and sisters, is no longer number one in Samson's life. It's Delilah, has every part of it. And you know what? She knows it. And when Delilah saw, you see, Delilah could tell that she'd won. She could tell that she had him. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. And she says, come up this once, for he has showed me everything. She could see into his eyes that he just laid out everything that she wanted to know. The relief would wash over Samson because she had pressed him daily. He showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought the money in their hands. Look at the power of it. She's won. She's endured mockery for this. And she would pick that phone up and say, you come now and bring your money with you. He showed me everything. This new supreme confidence comes over the, over the telephone through to the five lords of the Philistines. Supremely confident with the information she's got. And they come running. Have a look in verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees. That word sleep there, similar word used for when Adam slept. A deep, deep sleep. Of almost like a, a man relieved that his wife would just stop going at him the whole time, pressing him every single day. And she makes him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head what a moment that is brothers and sisters he has protected that and been told to protect that for as long as he's been alive and now he finally yields doesn't he wasn't that what Solomon said would happen in Proverbs chapter 7 later on he'd refer to that very thing with her much fair speech she causes him to yield and that's what he does is he falls asleep on, his, on her knees there with his head in the lap. And along would come a man and he would hold up the great seven locks and while he's in the deepest of sleep would take those scissors and cut it straight off. Do you know, brothers and sisters, 
You know what would happen with your hair? The symbol of your separation. In the Nazarite vow, in Numbers chapter 6, what you would do, in verse 18 it says in the Nazarite, this is at the time that you would finish your period of separation in verse 18, shall shave off of his, uh, shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle and shall take the hair of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. They would lift that sacrifice up and put that hair under there. It would be offered up to God in a symbol of the, the, the completion of that period of time. They would take it and they would offer it up right there at the door of the tabernacle and he's offered his up to Delilah. Laying there on his knees, she comes along and takes his separation. And look what she does next. She takes the seven locks and began to afflict him. And his strength went from her. His heart had belonged to someone else now. And his strength was gone. Can you imagine her taunting him? Oh, this is why she's in this game. It's not for the money. It's for the victory. She's been mocked and mocked and mocked and lied to. She's had behaviour exhibited to her she doesn't ever put up with and now she's won. You imagine her holding his face? Oh, what's wrong? And he would do that. As he, as he woke up, he'd grab his hair and he'd realise that it's gone. He'd see it laying on the ground. That big matted mess of seven locks that had never been touched his whole life, probably down to here. It's all laying on the ground. And look what he says. And she says to him, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he woke up out of his sleep. And he said, I will go out at, uh, as at other times before and shake myself. And this is how Samson saw himself because that word shake there means to rustle the mane. So it's almost like he thought, I will get up and, and like a lion, I will roar like I do to these people. And he went to shake his great mane of hair and it wasn't there. And he didn't know that God had departed from him. And the Philistines grabbed him. Imagine what that felt like for this man. The first time in two decades he didn't have the strength. And they grabbed hold of him and he'd go to push back and realise he was as what he'd been quoting, an ordinary man. This is what it felt like to be ordinary. And in type, a great wave of those things that represent sin and everything that he would fight against just jumped straight on him and flattened him into the ground. He'd never felt it before. Flattened him into the ground. And they grabbed him and they took him, it says, and we know the story. They put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. It was a horrendous practice back in those times, wasn't it? The last king of Judah had his eyes put out in 2 Kings 25 and verse 7. It was done by many different uh, methods. And you can research it, young people. I encourage you to go and research it. <laughs> it's quite interesting to have a look at. It's gory. But they'd either burn them out of your head or they'd just use an implement and just put it in the corner of your eye and just pop it out against your own skull. And the thing would come out and just pull the cord out. See you later. Your whole eye out or just cauterize it in the top of your head. It's what they used to do. And they used to, to, they used to get these, whether it would be kings or important people, and they would do heinous acts to their own families as the last thing they ever saw with their eyes and then push them out. And isn't it incredible, brothers and sisters, that the man whose name means brilliant sunlight is now plunged into darkness. Plunged into darkness and they would put out his eyes and bring him to Gaza. And what would they say? What would they say as they bring him down to Gaza with great big black holes in his head where his eyes were? And he's bound, it says, and they bind him with fetters of brass, double brass, it means. That means hands and feet. The very things that he did with his hands got him where he was and the very path that he trod with his feet got him where he was. 
He's bound now by what, the, what brass represents, which is the flesh in, around his hands and his feet. He's all bound up. And where are they leading him through? Back through. He's walking through the gates of his enemies. And they grab him and they'd scream in his ear, you know where you're going, don't you? You're walking through the gates that you took. We've rebuilt them. And they're stronger than ever. I'd like to see you take these with Noah. There's no way he's going to be able to do that. Is there? They're all bound up. And he did grind in the prison house. Look at the irony in that. You know, Samson had destroyed their economy in, in chapter 15 and verse 5. Every bit of food years before. And look what he does now. Bound up by the flesh. He feeds his enemies. He feeds them. You know, under the Lord in, in uh, Exodus chapter 22, if you accidentally burnt down your neighbor's crops, you had to feed them. Great irony, isn't it? You had to pay all of that back. That's what he's doing here. He burnt all the corn to the ground and now he's feeding them. How be it, it says, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And as someone rightly said yesterday, and we had a great night last night listening with the young people to a, an uh, audio play, a period of time here for Samson to stop and reflect on his life. We don't know how long it was, long enough for his hair to begin to grow again. But you can imagine what it was like for this man, as it's, as it's depicted, going around and around in circles, feeding his enemies. Imagine how he felt. Imagine now in the darkness that was his, his state of life. Imagine as the clarity began to creep in. The messages. It's so often that, that we begin to see things clearly in the darkest, most difficult times of our life. It's the very reason they come, isn't it? We're told that in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is so much that we can apply to this story in Samson. But a huge amount of it is about our trial and the difficulties that come on. And these, these trials are often brought about by our own doing, aren't they? By the, by the circumstances we get ourselves into. Have a look at what James says about the circumstance that Samson finds himself in. Every man is capable of being drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. There it is. But he's got to know and he's got to learn how to that God's going to work with him. And we're exactly the same. We have these times where it's deep and it's dark and it's difficult and we can't see. And yet after a period of time of reflection, we began to have a small amount of clarity. I believe that's what happened in Samson's life. And in verse 23, the lords of the Philistines gather them together for to offer a great sacrifice under Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God has delivered our Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Now, brothers and sisters, if you want to highlight anything in these couple of verses, have a look at the change the change in conversation by the Philistines. The lords of the Philistines gather themselves together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon. Then they say, our God has delivered. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Our God has delivered. Later on in verse 24, you see what they've done? They haven't made this about their victory over Samson, they've done the worst thing that they could possibly do. And they have brought in God into the, the equation. And now they grab hold of Dagon, their God, and they face him off with Yahweh. And they bring the two into the arena. This has not got anything to do with Samson, nothing to do with the Philistines. They're now challenging God's supreme authority and control as the creator of all the universe. That's what they're doing. Let's get Samson here 
We're going to offer a great sacrifice unto our God. Why? Because our God has delivered Samson into the hands, into our hands. We praise our God in verse 24. He has delivered into our hands the destroyer of our country. And now it changes, doesn't it? You don't think God's ears were all listening about what was going to happen here. He's a long way from leaving Samson. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry, mishte, the same drinking feast, that Samson would, would get his friends uh, to, involved in it, his own wedding, the same as the young men used to do, as it says, back in chapter 13, uh, 14. Here they are, the young men are at it again when their hearts were merry and they said, call for Samson that he might make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport. And they set for him between the pillars. We, we, we can't quite understand what this must have been like for Samson. We can try. Incredibly difficult moment in this man's life. The great and mighty man is now kept perhaps underneath this city of Gaza, chained up. And every now and then he would be called to be, to be brought out. This man was somewhat of a legend in and amongst their community. They would teach their kids about this man that used to have incredible strength, that would overthrow armies. And you can imagine the stories of the, of the jawbone and the ass that only got bigger and bigger and bigger in Philistine folklore. And they would sit there and tell their, their, their children of a man that took out tens of thousands with, with this jawbone, not a thousand. It would grow and grow and then and now they want to put a feast on and they would bring out this man that was once mighty with big charred uh, holes in his head where his eyes once were and they would poke fun at him. And it's not a small crowd either. You look down there in verse 27. On the roof there were about 3,000 men and women. And we don't know what the building looked like. I mean, paint your own picture in your mind. But quite often they would have a like amphitheatre type uh, seating on the roof. So there would be like an open court, perhaps the size of the hall here, and then all the way around up on another level, all the way around like that, you would be able to, there would be stacked seating. You'd be able to look down inside the area. Maybe much bigger than that. We don't know. There, inevitably, there's thousands of people here because he ends up killing more people in this one moment than he did in his whole life put together. And he put a few away. There's thousands there. And out he comes and they drag him up for sport. And look at it in verse 26. And Samson says to the lad that held him by the hand, look at that, the mightiest man of Israel, the strongest man that has ever lived, is led at the hands by a small boy. And he says, suffer me that I might feel the pillars upon the where." whereupon the house stands that I might lean upon them. And God specifically tells us in verse 27, now the house was full. You couldn't fit another person in there. And here they are at a big feast. And you can imagine the smell of food in, in, the, in the great open areas with all the fires and the coal, the coal fires all cooking those beautiful foods, the smell just wafting through, all the wine being spilt and drank everywhere. Thousands of people there, the music, the chanting, the Philistine behavior, which was abhor abhorred by the, by the surrounding nation. And there it is. He is smack bang in the middle of that, and he is front and center their sport. And it says, in verse 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I might be once avenged of the Philistines for mine eye. And here is the prayer from the heart of Samson. He's had time to stop and think about this moment. And when we started our studies, we remember we made the point that this life of separation, this vow of the Nazarite, this purpose that God sought occasion with the Philistines was given to Samson, wasn't it? And as his life moves through, remember, the spirit of God comes mightily on Samson. And it comes on Samson. 
and it comes on Samson. Time and time again, that spirit is given to him that he might fulfill that purpose. And for the first time in his life, brothers and sisters, he turns around and he asks for it. That's the circumstances in in his life. He turns around and he looks up and he says, I pray thee, strengthen me. Never asked for it since yet, has he? And now he needs it. I need what you do in my life. He says, strengthen me, I pray this once, O God, that I might be avenged of my two eyes. And Samson, it says, takes hold of of the two middle pillars on which the house stood, on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And you can imagine him just feeling out, telling that little boy to run for his life and feeling out. And all he needs to do now is is to get hold of these things and he's determined in his mind and he prays with all of his heart to his God, give me your strength just this once. And he takes hold, the word there means to twist. It's like he twists his body on these two things. And he cries out, he says, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all of his might. He bows himself and it would be Solomon later in Proverbs 7. Remember when that young man, her her speech causes him to yield. That's the word bow. That young man would bow at the feet of that woman. And it's what he did with Delilah, wasn't it? On his knees, he bowed to her and she took his heart. And now he bows before his God. He's had time to think. He bows with all of his might. And in this moment, you know God is number one. Why is God number one? Because Samson now gives God back his heart and his soul and his strength, does he not? Because out of the mouth, The abundance of the heart is known, as the Lord Jesus Christ said. And that's where his prayers come from, his heart. He's going to give his soul because he's going to give his life to his God. And he bows with all his strength. God has taken the rightful place, the number one place in his life. And now he bows with all his might. And you can see the man pushing there. And to his great relief, brothers and sisters, his prayer is heard and he feels those pillars move just that little bit. Imagine the feeling that washed over him in that moment with a great struggle. And it would move and fall and chaos would reign in that building, wouldn't it? As one would knock into the other before people even realised what was going on. The fires are overturned. There's people running everywhere, thousands of people screaming and crying as as the great platforms above on the roof would slide down into the main arena, crushing hundreds and thousands of people. And our hero lies dead underneath all of that rubble, brothers and sisters. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And that's the end of the life of that man, Samson. It says, then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him. And they brought him up. And where did they bring him? They brought him to the place where it all began, between Zorah and Eshtahol. It's where the story started. In the burying place of Manoah, his father. And Samson is brought home. He comes home and he's buried next to his father whose name means rest. He's at rest for the time, isn't he? What does Hebrews 11 say about the man that we've considered this weekend? Well, if I was to paraphrase paraphrase just a few verses together, this is what Paul records of this man that we've considered. And what shall I say more, he says, For the time would fail me to tell of Samson, who through faith stopped lions. He escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness was made strong, who waxed valiant in fight, of whom the world was not worthy. 
And he, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having foreseen something better for us, that only together with us, he will be made perfect. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but at the end, I, I, I often wonder what would have been said as they laid Samson to rest. Perhaps it was what was said at the end of that Nazarite vow. The Lord has blessed you, Samson, and he's kept you. The Lord made his face to shine on him, did he not? He was gracious unto him. The Lord lifted up his countenance on him. And a day is coming, brothers and sisters, not too far away, where he will be given peace. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.